Hello, everybody. Glad you could join us for Grand Rounds on this beautiful sunny day outside. Um, we are pleased to welcome back our speaker, Dr. David Horsheimer, who many of you know from his time at Sinai as a resident, a fellow, um, and his faculty uh, for many years, during which time he helped uh, direct the culinary care unit, has served as the director of, the, of cardiovascular education and the director of consultative cardiology. Since 2015, he's been over at uh, Montefiore, where he is the director of clinical cardiology, and we're glad that he made some time to come back and speak with us today about lipid risk factors. Dr. Horsham. Thank you, Dr. Weissman. It's a pleasure to be with you, albeit uh, somewhat remote by Zoom. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Great. Okay, so uh, let's get started a little bit, and I wanted to talk a little bit today about something that's common, but a little bit of the uncommon and a different way perhaps to look at it as we encounter our patients. In terms of disclosures, uh, none. Um, this statistic is always the introductory slide to almost every uh, talk. Um, the yellow part is what everybody talks about, how relevant it is, but what I wanna talk about is the last line, which is in the very brief introduction that Dr. Weissman mercifully uh, gave, uh, three people in the United States have had a heart attack already while we were waiting. Um, and that's the challenge that all of us face, uh, principally as um, not only as specialists in cardiology, but I would argue uh, from a public health point of view, more specifically and more effectively uh, in the primary care uh, arena. And that's what I wanted to speak with you today. Um, this is an old slide. I, it's, I left it with the original sort of blue background because nothing much has changed uh, in something that's very important. And this is the relationship in all of the clinical trials between LDL levels and the relative risk of coronary heart disease. And it's a straight line, um, adjusted a little bit. But the bottom line is, is that the intersection of the y-axis and the relative risk of one comes at an LDL of 40. And it emphasizes to us that, you know, the day-to-day -day battle that we have is to focus principally on LDL. And as I will show you today, um, to keep in mind not only the LDL, but all the other components of the risk of the lipid risk profile um, that are relevant in 2021. So, it, you know, this is certainly not something that is exclusive to cardiologists. We see this all the time. Um, and, you know, to that end, appropriately, we would be remiss if we did not sort of emphasize the number one recommendation in the ACCAHA guidelines for lipid modification, which is a diet emphasizing intake uh, appropriately. The reality is, is that most of us don't do this because we don't have time. Uh, in, in, in the limited time that an encounter, particularly in a patient with multiple primary care problems, hypertension, diabetes, lipidemia, other things, uh, unfortunately, this falls by the wayside. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it should necessarily be overlooked. And the cartoon is there as sort of a brief reminder of that. Um, and the guidelines basically dive in that way. And I just want to toggle back and forth between this uh, summary slide of the most recent iteration of the uh, all the society guidelines for the management of cholesterol. Um, we're going to spend a very, very brief period of time talking about the primary care and the rest of our time talking about what we share together, which is the patients with established cardiovascular disease. So again, healthy lifestyle at the top and then a bifurcation immediately into the patients, not so much at high risk and the very high risk, particularly with established disease, okay? The challenge I think that we have as a public health system so far is that as much as we can relentlessly try to follow what's called guideline-based medicine, the practical reality is that over and over again, and this has been shown now for more than two decades, that even the most aggressive adherence to the guidelines, the vast majority of patients with premature coronary artery disease in the United States do not meet guideline criteria for preventive therapy before their first MI, okay? Um, and this is age of the first myocardial infarction, looking at all the class one recommendations, even the class two A recommendations. The two guidelines, the 2013 and the most recent reiteration. And the bottom line is, is that if you look for patients under 55, only about 40% of the patients would qualify for therapy. In the mid range, which is really the business district of cardiovascular disease, 55 to 65, a significant proportion would never have been treated. And what's fascinating about this analysis uh, is that even after the patients develop established coronary artery disease, the same deficiencies still occur. So the takeaway point is that we have to be aggressive with what we know, but we still have to drive and push harder um, to make sure that we're capturing all of our patients. The reality is, is that um, I think that cardiovascular disease is undergoing a sort of conceptual transformation. For a very, very long time, the uh, 
emphasis has been on prediction of risk and better prediction of risk. In the modern era, I think many of you who are sort of in training and, and about to embark upon your careers will see a sort of a conceptual shift in cardiology where we move away from risk prediction and we move towards documentation of established cardiovascular disease. Because once there's established cardiovascular disease, and particularly, I just sort of threw in a slide about the coronary artery calcium score, but coronary artery um, CT angiogram as well for the patients at a little bit of higher risk, is really becoming much more normative and much more embedded into many of the guidelines in the ED for the evaluation of chest pain, in the outpatient setting for the evaluation of chest pain, and even for the assessment of cardiovascular risk. So I think that one thing that will change a little bit in terms of our paradigm is we will no longer be guessing and we will be making a little bit more evidence-based decisions on whether or not the patient at hand already has established evidence of cardiovascular disease. It doesn't necessarily need to be necessarily need to be cardiac disease. It can be evidence of carotid atherosclerosis on a carotid sonogram. It can be evidence of abdominal aortic atherosclerosis on an incidentally performed abdominal uh, ultrasound or something else. This is really all I wanted to say about uh, primary prevention. And I wanna spend the rest of the time talking about the kind of patients that we in clinical cardiology share with you, uh, which is the patients with established cardiovascular disease. And um, to this end, what I really wanna do is toggle through these various sort of parameters of cardiovascular risk and discuss with you for each of these uh, various arrows at the top, how we identify the patients who remain at risk and what we can do when we find them. So for each one of these, we're gonna spend a few minutes basically triggered by patient you know, encounters that I've had, which I think have illuminated for me a, par a paradigm for thinking about this, um, and hopefully share with you a way to sort of think about our patients as well. Okay, so again, we're talking about the right-hand side of the algorithm, the patients at high risk. High intensity or maximal statin, that's class one indication. And then when the patient may or may not get to goal, there's a number of adjunctive therapies that we'll begin to talk about uh, over the coming minutes. So just a quick word about statins. They seem to be sort of, you know, they obviously are the mainstay and there seems to be relatively less new about them since the class kind of has, I think, eclipsed where it's going in terms of development. But an important point, and this does for those of you who are taking the medicine boards in the next couple of months, this question is, uh, or at least used to be, I haven't done it for a while, but, uh, the last three times I've taken the boards, not all at the same time, but over a long period of time, this question has appeared um, over and over again, which is the anticipated incremental LDL reduction by changing the dose of a statin. And the takeaway point, and this is, I think, something to be remembered every day in clinic, which is that the majority of statin LDL efficacy is achieved at the starting dose. You see the three major quote-unquote high-potency statins, um, and you see there are differences in the incremental dose in purple. Um, about the starting dose. But what is true across the class of statins is the so-called rule of the sixes, namely that each subsequent doubling of the statin dose will only further lower the LDL by a further 6%. Another way of thinking about that, as you go from whatever baseline LDL accomplishment you're able to attain with a, a torvastatin, if you started at 80, starting at, at 10 rather, and then you went from 10 to 80, you'd only get a further 18% reduction in LDL. This is something that's important to talk to patients about because if you start a patient on a low dose and then increase the dose, when a patient goes from 10, of 20, 10 to 20 of resuvastatin, they expect a doubling of their LDL effect and they're not gonna get it. And we should be able to understand that and have a conversation about that and integrate that into the way we're thinking because the fundamental engine of the way we approach LDL is, here's where the patient is, here's where the patient needs to get to, and are we doing what we need to do to make sure that they move from where they are to the appropriate target, okay? Um, to delve a little bit further into, you know, just residual cholesterol risk, this is one of the most famous uh, sayings that is often cited in uh, many of the primary prevention talks, that 50% of all heart attacks occur despite, quote, unquote, normal cholesterol levels. And this is often cited by the people who um, feel that cholesterol is really not the risk factor that cardiologists doubt it to be, or that there's some other risk factors which perhaps we're overlooking. The reality is, is that the source of this statement um, is a New England Journal article um, that was a transcript of a lecture, one of the named lectures of the American Heart Association that Dr. Brownwell gave about 20 years ago, the Shattuck lecture, where he made this comment. There's no uh, attribution to it, 
there's no citation for it, but it has become uh, sort of a slogan in some of the non-cholesterol approach to, uh, to, uh, approach to, to thinking about cardiovascular disease. And I would argue in retrospect that as we look back over you know, a further two decades since Dr. Brownwald made that observation, is that Dr. Brownwald, like he was, like he is in so many other things, was actually right. Um, it's just that the data wasn't there. And I think what this observation represents was certainly at the time and in many ways still at this time, our less than complete effectiveness in identifying patients who are at risk and understanding what's really going on with them. Um, and I'm just going to show you a couple of quick clinical vignettes from patients that I've seen, just because I think they help to highlight to me um, where, this, uh, where this comes into play. So this was a patient I obviously met a long time ago. Um, at the time, sort of the standard cardiovascular risk profile, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, former smoker, prior stroke, peripheral, art peripheral arterial disease, uh, first uh, onset of chest pain in 2005, and abnormal stress test, so-called triple vessel disease, but not really mostly LAD disease, and he had a stent then of the LAD. Nothing unusual here, as bread and butter, as routine as it could be. Um, in 2006, so this is uh, right around the time when he presented with his initial uh, event, cardiac event. These were his medicines. Obviously, many of the medicines represent medications that were uh, widely in use then, especially the statin, which obviously is a low potency statin, which we really don't use anymore. But still, in terms of 2006 numbers, his lipid profile was pretty good, uh, I would say. Um, sorry about that. And one could even argue that he was relatively at goal, uh, more or less. Certainly on, on first blush, I think if we saw this patient in clinic, we would say, you know, good to go, let's keep going. If we look at what happened to this patient over the ensuing um, year, uh, the patient came back for a stent of the circumflex, a year later came back with recurrent angina, and had a new lesion in the LAD. By this time, he had been switched to simvastatin. And his wife actually asked me what I thought was a very good question, which is, she said, you know, doc, we're doing everything that you're telling us to. He's taking his blood pressure medicines, taking his diabetes medicine, his hemoglobin A1C is controlled, and he's taking his cholesterol medicine, and his cholesterol looks to be under control. See here, you know? So what can you tell me to prevent me from making sure that, you know, my husband doesn't have another heart attack? So we looked at his LDL and his lipid profile that day. And so we'll just take a moment to uh, take a look at this. So what bothers one about this case? And I think as is often the case, the patient, or in this case, his wife, you know, really raised the, the relevant question, which is looking at these numbers, this patient should not be having recurrent events. This patient should not be, you know, a platinum frequent flyer in the cath lab having had four interventions in the last year and a half um, with this set of numbers and with his blood pressure and his diabetes similarly under control. So we're gonna divert for a second to begin to understand and to delve a little bit deeper. Uh, this goes back to the second year of medical school, which is the basic lipoprotein structure. Uh, remember that um, what we measure in LDL cholesterol is basically derived from the transport protein. So uh, we have looked for a number of years of factors beyond LDL level. And one of the things that you may have heard over the last couple of years is interest uh, in the cardiology point of view in LDL particles, and particularly LDL particle size or number. Um, the reality is, is that for a large period of time, most of this was dominated as much of you know, sciences in the contemporary United States is dominated by industry. And there was a large company, which is no longer in business, which seemed to have a, uh, an assay to distinguish large LDL from small LDL. And they made quite a bit of fuss about this and quite a bit of noise. And there was a great deal of sort of theoretical reason why small LDL was more dangerous because it could sneak through the wall in the space between um, two adjacent endothelial cells, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is, is that it has little probably to do with the size of the LDL and a lot more to do with the particle numbers. Because if you have two patients who have the same LDL concentration, both, let's say, with an LDL of 130. The ones who have a small LDL actually have a lot more particles. And the ones who have large LDL, this is sort of simple algebra, have many fewer particles. And at the end of the day, it's not the LDL concentration which confers the risk, but it is the atherogenicity of that patient, okay? And because they have more particles, they are at higher risk. 
And the reality is, is that, you know, even in, as part of the larger Mount Sinai, you know, system, you've all heard Dr. Fuster talk extensively about the mechanisms and the development of atherosclerosis. And the reality is, is that LDL particles promote atherogenesis by destroying one endothelial cell at a time. They pass through the endothelial cells and become so underneath. Particles develop into plaques. The monocytes come in, become fatty cells, and that's how cholesterol deposition happens. But it happens one LDL particle at a time. Now, in terms of translating this interesting sort of physiological, uh, you know, nostalgic look at the second year of medical school into uh, something that's actionable. So we all know about LDL cholesterol cut points. In other words, cutoff points for the guidelines. So for example, most of us are think about that there's some number in primary care, perhaps 130, perhaps 100. Uh, in secondary prevention, the LDL cholesterol is 70. Those numbers are actually derived from the Framingham study and they represent the percentiles in various um, population in the, in, a, in the bell-shaped curve. So for example, the 100th percentile, sorry, the 20th percentile of LDL represents an LDL of 100, and the 5th percentile of LDL represents an LDL of 70. Now, the good news is, is that if you measure LDL particle numbers directly, the percentile numbers track exactly the same with the particle numbers, but by a factor of 10. So for example, the 50th percentile of LDL is an LDL cholesterol of 130, and that correlates to an LDL particle number of 1300. Similarly, an LDL particle, an LDL cholesterol of 100, it's the 20th percentile, and that correlates to an LDL particle number of uh, 1000. Um, same thing depicted here, looking exclusively at LDL particle numbers where the fifth percentile of LDL particle number, again, correlates to 700. So there's a roughly 10 to one ratio in the average person between their LDL cholesterol and LDL particle number, assuming it's all being handled and transported appropriately. Okay, we'll skip that in the interest of time. So again, back to our patient. Um, he had, at the time of his third stent, an LDL of 64. So if we were to measure his LDL particle number on that day, we would reasonably anticipate an LDL particle number roughly 10 times 64, so roughly in the neighborhood of 640. And in fact, you can measure this commercially. Uh, there's a company in a lipopro which does a lipoprotein analysis, a company called Lipoprofile, um, which um, is available as an in-order test in the, in the main Sinai labs. It's available in the outpatient world through LabCorp, where you can actually measure LDL particle numbers. And lo and behold, in this patient, as you can see by the arrow here, the LDL particle number in this patient was not 640 or 650, but rather 1400, okay? Correlating, if you think about it backwards from a, from a percentile view, this means that for this individual patient, his LDL was roughly equal to an LDL of 140. And that's why he was having all these recurrent events. Because despite a seemingly reassuringly normal looking LDL cholesterol concentration, he was at risk and he was behaving that way. So what do you do about this? Um, what you do is that this LDL particle number then becomes as much as you can the, um, the therapeutic target for what you do. And the reason for that is because this has been demonstrated over and over again, is that there is a, a significant clinical implication of a discordance between LDL cholesterol numbers and LDL particle numbers. So for example, this is relative risk of something happening to the patient over five years of follow-up according to the ratio of their LDL particle number and their LDL cholesterol. So in the black is people who are quote unquote normal, whose LDL particle number and LDL cholesterol track by that 10 to one ratio. And they represent the average line. In the red is someone like our patient whose LDL particle number exceeds their LDL co their cholesterol by a ratio of 10 to one. And those are the patients who actually have a much higher risk of events happening. Interestingly, and we rely on this in primary prevention, or certainly I do, for decisions with, or conversations with patients about whether long-term statins are needed on the basis of an isolated LDL, is that the flip side of the equation also works as well. Namely, for patients whose LDL particle number is actually reassuringly lower than what would be projected by their LDL cholesterol, those patients actually have a more favorable outcome. It's not immunity, but they have more favorable outcomes. 
So for patients like the one that I showed you, where the LDL particle number is disproportionately elevated, what many people do is utilize this as the therapeutic target. And the good news is, is that this number responds to anything that you would typically use to lower LDL. So if you found your patient with an LDL of 140 and you went through your typical algorithm, whatever it might be, increasing the statin dose, switching to a more potent statin, adding Zetia, um, adding a PCSK9, as we'll talk about, any of those interventions which lower LDL can lower LDL particle number. And you can really make a difference with this patient. So we were intrigued by this. And I think that's actually, you know, again, I know that many of the people in the audience are residents and concluding, you know, quartile of their uh, training. One of the things that's actually really fun about a career in medicine, and certainly in cardiology, is that your learning never stops for all of us. That's true whether you're a PGY4 or a PGY3 or a PGY24 or whatever it is. Uh, and the reason of that is because if you ask appropriate questions, you continue to learn from patients. Many of you understandably at this juncture in your career are wondering like, how am I ever gonna learn something without a preceptor, without an attending? And the reality is you learn a lot on your own because you learn from patients who are in many ways, the greatest teachers of all. So this was an analysis that we ran, uh, really inspired by that individual patient and a couple of others, where we, at Sinai a couple of years ago, when I was still there, uh, we took uh, NMR lipoprotein, we measured NMR lipoprotein analysis in real world patients. So unlike many of the clinical trials, which have shown that if you do this for everybody, it doesn't really add anything incrementally, and you can readily understand why those trials ended up that way. Because if you have a patient whose LDL after recurrent events is 120, I don't need to know what their particle number is. I know they're not at goal. Where this technology becomes useful is patients who, on, by virtue of the conventional or superficial testing modalities, appear to be protected, are in fact not. So we looked at 400 patients, um, most of whom had coronary artery disease, secondary prevention, Mean lipid levels were actually pretty good in LDL of 71, HDL of 50, non-HDL of 94. So about two thirds of the patients, a little over half, had an LDL under 70. So on balance, this is patients in the cardiology practice. Uh, we looked at consecutive patients with, um, uh, with established cardiovascular disease. And the vast majority of the patients were actually at goal by conventional modalities. So then we said, okay, let's take this group of patients who, whose LDL appears to be at 70, and let's measure NMR lipoprotein analysis in them. And what did we find? That of this cohort of patients, that's roughly 400, who seemed to be at goal by conventional lipid profiles at the time, about a quarter had a disparity between the LDL particle number and the LDL goal. This is the representation of the patients who remain at residual risk for LDL, despite our conventional ability to measure. Now, the truth is you don't need to measure uh, LDL particle number. You can measure the same thing with APOB, which is the LDL carrying protein. And that is usually in most hospitals an in-house lab. And again, there are measurements for that. We look for an LDL, sorry, an APOB of around 85, which uh, confers essentially immunity the same way an LDL cholesterol of under 70 would be. So back to our algorithm. So we have our patient who is at high risk, high intensity or maximal statin. Where do we go from here? So I just want to spend a word about talking about high intensity or maximal statins, because one of the most vexing things that we deal with in clinical cardiology is the idea of statin tolerance. Um, and the definition of maximally tolerated or uh, highest dose available statin is one that continues to evolve. Um, muscle aches represent one of the most challenging problems that we have. There's an abundant amount of evidence that patients are aware of, and that is a very, very frequent um, cause for patients either to become completely non-adherent or become partially non-adherent to skip doses here and there. This was a fascinating analysis. Many of you saw the preliminary version of this in a letter to the editor in the New England Journal of Medicine about six months ago. And then there was a follow-up larger analysis published in the BMJ a couple of weeks ago where they took uh, a reasonable size cohort patients, 200 patients, all of whom had uh, basically severe muscle symptoms from being on a statin and who basically said, we're finished with that and we're not gonna try it, we're not gonna take it anymore. And what the investigators did was over the course of the, uh, of the, ensuing, um, <clears throat> the ensuing year, is they basically randomized the patients every two months um, to six months on, six months off, six months on, six months off, a Torva at a dose of uh, 20 milligrams. And they looked 
at a couple of things. First of all, they looked at the development of muscle symptoms, adjusted according to when the patient was on statin or on placebo. And while 60 something percent of the patients in the total trial complained of intractable muscle aches, the frequency of that complaint was identical as to whether or not the patient was on a statin or whether or not they were on a placebo. Similarly, the withdrawal rate was identical, about 8%, regardless of whether or not the patient was on a statin or on a placebo. And what this, because it was an N equals one trial where the patient was his or her own control, it became a useful opportunity for the investigators at the conclusion of the trial to have a conversation with the patient and say, look, I see that you're having terrible muscle aches, but it really doesn't appear that you, would, that you are having those symptoms attributable to the statin because they are occurring in you with equal frequency, whether or not you're on the statin or not. Given the importance of being on a statin, uh, would you see yourself clear to considering resumption of the statin based upon how important it is for your medical regimen? And two thirds of the patients said yes. So there's a very important take home lesson in terms of the interaction that we as clinicians have with our patients, that it's important to remember that when the patients have uh, muscle aches, and we'll come back to one important caveat in a second, that a lot of times the patients can be coaxed through it um, just with a little bit more education. It's important to keep in mind that in this trial, the patients were enrolled in the absence of an elevated CPK. So obviously, if a patient does complain of muscle aches, it's important to make sure that they don't have an elevated CPK because you don't want to be giving them uh, ongoing statin treatment in the setting of myalgias with an elevated CPK and hopefully not cause, cause rhabdo. But for many of our patients who drop out of conventional statins or are intolerant to higher doses of statins, we can certainly make a difference in what they're doing. And this is simply a matter of conversation. So let's go back to our, our, our patients. So we, we have our patients who are at residual uh, cholesterol risk, and we've talked a little bit about how we can identify those um, with an LDL above 100, and I would argue even with an LDL above 70 if the patient has known cardiovascular disease. So the guidelines obviously weigh in on this because this is the most frequent scenario that we encounter a patient with high-risk atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease already on high-intensity or maximal tolerated statin who's not at goal. So the next step would be the addition of azetamide, and it's 10 milligrams, one size fits all. Um, and then there are some medicines that we'll talk about thereafter. So again, uh, as many of you know, um, cardiology really has been revolutionized in terms of limit management by the PCSK9 uh, antagonist. And just as a quick review again um, about the basic science, so PCSK9, as we'll show in a second, is part of the body's housekeeping for LDL metabolism. So if you remember from, the, from you know, again, back to the second year of medical school, to the glory days in the lecture hall, um, the LDL receptor sits on the surface of the hepatocyte, and the LDL receptor and the LDL receptor sort of just sort of sits there, catching these snowballs of LDL that are floating through the circulation. Once the LDL receptor grabs a molecule of LDL, it pulls it through uh, the cell membrane, uh, where it becomes a uh, vesicle, which ultimately undergoes lysosomal degradation. But only the LDL undergoes the lysosomal LDL degradation. Uh, lysosomal degradation, the LDL receptor is released and goes back to the surface to catch another molecule of LDL. And in normal function, in normal sort of life cycle, and the LDL receptor makes 50 trips in and out of the cell before it's ultimately degraded in the, um, after it's kind of quote unquote worn out. That's if nothing else was left to play. However, um, the body has, as is often the case, sort of a counter-regulatory medicine, which is PCSK9. PCSK9 is that protein which promotes the degradation of LDL receptors. So here, in the presence of PCSK9, the same thing happens. The LDL receptor grabs the molecule of LDL, sucks it through the, uh, through the cell membrane, where it becomes a vesicle. But here, in the lysosomal degradation, both the LDL molecule and the LDL receptor are destroyed by lysosomal degradation. So the LDL receptor, instead of having 50 round trips, now has one before it's destroyed. And obviously there are then the, the other 49 LDL molecules are free to float around in the circulation and wreak havoc in the arterial walls. What the PCSK9 antagonists do is they block PCSK9. So by virtue of blocking PCSK9, they now allow the LDL receptor um, to reconstitute itself, those 
50 normal trips and obviously have a tremendous impact on LDL reduction. So it, within, with uh, the PCSK9 antagonist in pre uh, present, the LDL receptor goes through the normal transit and is then released again to keep going to catch LDL molecules on the surface of the receptor. Uh, there are two of them in clinical um, that are available in the United States. We'll talk about price in a second. Slight differences, they're both administered by injection. Um, subcutaneous injection, which the patient can do himself or herself. It's actually easier to do than, than insulin because both device, both uh, agents have automatically self-injected devices. And in terms of access, they both become a lot easier to access because you no longer have to write the prescription through a specialty pharmacy. The regular old CVS or Walgreens or Dwayne Reed on the corner uh, can obtain and dispense these drugs without much, um, with, without much, without much fuss on the part of the prescribing physician. In terms of in terms of evidence to support this, so this is the one of the major trials looking at uh, Golakumab, one of the two, one of the PCSK9 patients with established coronary disease already on maximal dose statin therapy, plus or minus ezetimibe with an LDL above 70, half getting the PCSK9, half getting the placebo, followed initially for um, for a very short course, but then longer as well. So a couple of things that are available. Number one, on top of whatever else you're getting, you can achieve a roughly 50 to 60% reduction in LDL, okay? Number two, because it's a monoclonal antibody and it doesn't require sort of getting into the mechanics of the hepatic enzyme, it actually works very quickly. The truth is the LDL is brought down literally within a day or two. Uh, so unlike lipids uh, that are adjusted, let's say four to eight weeks after any sort of diet or statin related intervention, these numbers go down literally in a day and the benefit is durable out to a long period of time. And not surprisingly, there is a clinical correlation with that, which is in a composite of cardiovascular endpoints, there's about a 15% reduction in events that is achieved over three months. Um, it's widely known that there's a great deal of concern about the cost of these medications. The reality is, is that the cost that you see in the newspaper or in the Wall Street Journal has very, very little to do with the cost to the patient, although many times the copay for the patient can be high. But the reality is, is using a conventional cost effectiveness analysis. This is the analysis from Jack about a year ago from the Odyssey trial, um, that certainly for patients with an LDL of 100 or more uh, and established cardiovascular disease, um, the, the PCS canines are well within the boundaries of what we consider cost effective in the United States today. Um, in terms of uh, other opportunities for, um, for uh, PCSK9, this is a, a slightly different mechanism. This is an mRNA antagonist, uh, which turns off secretion of the gene for the PCSK9, uh, very analogous to what's been going on uh, with the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. Again, you saw this in the New England Journal of Medicine about a year ago. Um, the clinical trial is still ongoing. Other medications that are available now in the United States, already FDA approved, available at a drugstore you know, near your patient, uh, is pentapeptidic acid, which is a prodrug. It works in the cholesterol synthesis pathway in the same pathway as statins, but it works at a different place. So whereas the statins, as we all remember, inhibit HMG-CoA reductase, uh, pentapeptidic acid works more proximally. The bottom line is, is two things. Um, three things that, that is important to keep in mind. Number one, there is a synergistic effect in terms of combining it with statin. So this is another way to further lower LDL, and I'll show you some data in a second. Uh, number two, because it does work proximally in the cascade, it actually upregulates the LDL receptors for the patients and therefore makes the patient's own LDL receptor more efficient. And uh, Because there is no abempeptidicolic acid present in skeletal muscle, there is no cross-reactivity and there's no entity of, of muscle side effects related to this. This was the clear harmony study, which is the pivotal trial that essentially established it getting reduced, getting approved. And you see here about a 15% reduction in LDL. So again, um, not a huge reduction in LDL, but another incremental way to chip away at the LDL for patients who are not uh, necessarily at goal. Okay, so in terms of time, I wanted to leave um, adequate time for questions. I had discussed this with Ryan before last week. So in terms of two of the other parameters on the slide, residual inflammatory risk, 
Although we do have a biomarker to assess it, the reality is, is that the clinical trial data is a little bit controversial. And in the interest of time, since it's not part of the mainstream, I think we'll skip that. Similarly, there are patients who have residual thrombotic risk as the mechanism for their recurrent disease. The challenge there is that there's no simple biomarker. And perhaps there are ways to sort of be more targeted in antithrombotic reduction. And there are certainly trials which have looked at that. But the reality is, again, these two are a little bit more sketchy and a little bit more far afield uh, from the bread and butter observation of what we're talking about today, which is residual lipid risk. And that's why I want to spend the rest of our time talking about these two. So again, another patient that I saw, uh, slightly different patient, 64-year-old male. Um, this is a more recent one. LDL, pretty close to goal. HDL, not too bad. You know, an LDL a cholesterol profile, again, which in the patients with established cardiovascular disease, we would say is not that unusual. And it's probably pretty reasonable. I mean, many of us would reasonably look at this if the patient was on statin monotherapy and say, you know what, it's pretty close. Let's repeat it in a few months. Okay, and yet that patient is exactly the definition of a very, very large group of patients that we still see, patients whose residual cholesterol lipid risk is actually not defined by their LDL, but by their triglycerides, which historically have really been overlooked in cardiology as we have focused largely on LDL, and for a long period of time, certainly in the clinical trials, focusing on HDL. But the reality is, is there's a lot of data that has emerged lately, both mechanistically, observationally, and most important clinical trial intervention data, which now reinforms us that we need to look a little bit more carefully at this for patients not with astronomically high triglycerides, as we were once brought up on, looking at the patients with an LDL of four, a triglyceride level of four or 500, but the bread and butter sort of run of the mill, meatball kind of and spaghetti triglyceride of over 200, that is another opportunity for us to make uh, an intervention. So again, remembering that we're uh, back again for another quick last final visit to the second year of medical school. Uh, we, we know that the prototypical cholesterol molecule is a combination of triglycerides, active cholesterol, and some sort of uh, cholesterol transport protein, remnant cholesterol, which is what we look at, many of us are interested in today, total cholesterol minus the HDL minus the L LDL. And that gives all of the non-LDL related cholesterol in one simple number. So um, obviously this field was ignited really turbocharged by a paper that many of you saw uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago, looking at uh, icosopentaenoic acid, um, fish oil, four grams a day, looking at patients with coronary artery disease or diabetes on a statin, LDL already under 100, so pretty good. And their enrollment criteria was triglycerides above 130 and 135. And the primary endpoint, um, composite of a bunch of cardiovascular uh, endpoints. And again, um, patients with an event, primary endpoint, secondary endpoints, very, very significant reductions. A 25% reduction in clinical events out to five years. And this really was very, very impressive because remember that these patients, again, on balance, did not appear to be that vulnerable. Their LDLs were mostly at goal and their triglycerides were not hideously out of control. Um, let's go back a second. Uh, interestingly, what, what really sort of made a lot of people interested about this is that the reduction in cardiovascular events appeared to be higher than the reduction in triglyceride levels, suggesting that perhaps there were even other mechanisms beyond simple triglyceride reduction uh, that were important. Now, the reality is, is that um, the trial was highly controversial because the placebo group in included patients taking many of them something else. And there was a lot of speculation as to whether or not the placebo arm may have actually uh, fared worse than a conventional placebo arm. We'll talk for a second about some of the other fish oil trials. But the bottom line is that in the wake of this, obviously, data that was ongoing, but two analyses that were published back to back in Jack last year is that looking at the, impl the clinical implications of remnant cholesterol, the, the formula that we talked about, total cholesterol minus HDL minus LDL, looking at everything else. Two trials around the world, one from Spain, one from Copenhagen, basically showing the same thing, namely that if you look at patients whose LDL looks reasonable by whatever definition you want to do, there is still a significant and incremental hazard of an elevated remnant cholesterol, which for most of our patients entails their uh, triglycerides. Now, fish oils are not new. They've been around for a long time. 
And one of the things that has also become interesting in the wake of the publication of the Medusa trial is a greater sort of in-depth understanding. When the patient says, why do I need a prescription drug? Can I go to my health food store? Can I go to Costco and just buy, you know, a thousand pills of fish oil? The answer is yes, no, and maybe, because it may actually depend upon the composition of the fish oil. So specifically, whereas icosopentanoic acid, that was the uh, vehicle in the Reducer trial, was associated with a significant reduction in clinical events, a similar trial that was undergoing at the same time, the strength trial using a slightly different fish oil, one that was largely composed of DHA, which you can see is a different molecular structure, was terminated prematurely after a lack of, for futility, for lack of efficacy. So I think the correct answer for our patients is there is certainly evidence that fish oils work, particularly for patients with elevated triglycerides, but it is important to practice evidence-based medicine and use, at least for now, the one that has been proven in clinical trials. And this, again, is FDA approved. It actually just a week or two ago became generic um, in terms of where we are. So we have a fair amount of evidence now, again, to identify a second cohort of our patients very much under our noses, patients with triglycerides above 200, particularly those with an HDL under 40, okay? One more clinical vignette uh, from a patient that I saw, again, fairly recently, about two years ago. So this is a young uh, patient who presented with uh, an acute MI. And as you can see, the LAD, you know, has a very tight uh, stenosis here. There's lesions in the circumflex, which is terrible. And the right coronary has um, at least a 50% stenosis over here. So you have the, the infarct-related artery over here. You have terrible disease in the circumflex and the branches of the circumflex and the RCA. And again, looking at this patient, he's 39 years old. Um, he actually works for the Yankees, although he doesn't play for them, although the way they're playing lately, he could with this, uh, with this heart. Um, and you see what was fascinating to me again about this patient was I picked the patient up when I was on service in 2018 when he presented with his MI. And his lipid profile at that time, again, was not particularly outrageous. What was fascinating to me was, you know, you don't like to sort of be a Monday morning quarterback, but I went to, you know, back to 2016. And the reality is for a gentleman who was young, no high blood pressure, no diabetes, no smoking history, no family history, his LDL profile in 2016 was not particularly outrageous. The truth is, Many people would, reasonable people, I think in primary care and even in cardiology, might not have thought about treating this gentleman in the absence of risk factors. We might've had a conversation with him perhaps about lowering this number a little bit, but this is not the kind of number that we typically see in patients who present with triple vessel disease at the age of 39 in the absence of any other risk factors. So that's what bothered me about this case. And again, there's another component of risk that has become important which is lipoprotein little a, LP little a. And we measured in this patient and his LP little a was uh, 338, normal is about 70. So again, his LP little a was you know, astronomically high. And again, in the modern world, LP little a has become an emerging risk factor. So again, this is one of the PCSK9 trials. And the question that was posed here and is examined here is LP little a quartile for H for adjusted for LDL. So the takeaway point again, is that regardless of the level of one's LDL cholesterol, including patients whose LDL cholesterol was reasonable, although they were on placebo in this arm, right? There is a significant gradient of risk attributable to LP little a, despite whatever the LDL is. And this was confirmed again in the, in the Fourier trial, which was the parallel trial of the other uh, uh, PCSK9 agent, where again, this was looking at LPA above or below the median, um, whether the patient was on PCSK9 or placebo. And again, a huge gradient of risk singularly attributable to LP little a, even when patients were on the PCSK9. Um, there is an antisense oligonuclide, which is coming under clinical trials now. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of months ago, now a year or two ago, I guess, looking at the impact of uh, dropping LP little a. So we have now a bunch of trials which have now identified for us a spectrum of opportunities for patients who are, have established coronary artery disease, who on basis of simple lipid profile may still have an elevated LDL cholesterol, an elevated triglyceride, 
or an elevated LP little a. And the good news is that in the modern world, these are not sort of idle theoretical goose chases, wild goose chases where we're looking for something to say, oh, gee, that's interesting and there's nothing to do about it. Each of these has a well-established uh, foundation and clinical trials for interventions that can target the residual risk that you've identified and to make a difference in the clinical outcomes for the patient. Um, and that's really, I just wanted to spend sort of two minutes highlighting that as well, because the reality is, is if you listen to what's interesting in cardiology these days, most of what's on the front page of the newspapers, of the Wall Street Journal, most of what captures the headlines is interventional cardiology. There is the thinking that you know, and certainly as a general cardiologist, even we um, can sometimes sort of be buffeted by this, the notion that, you know, the way to heal in cardiology is with steel, that you have to, in order to save lives in clinical cardiology, you have to be an interventional cardiologist to be able to implant a stent, you have to be able to do structural heart, you have to be able to do EP. And everything else is kind of like, gee, isn't that nice, but come on, everybody really knows that that's not really where the business district of saving lives is. And what I wanna conclude with for you, and I think this is really the most important point, is that the reality is, is that the evidence abundantly shows that it's actually quite the opposite. That all of these interventions make a difference, but the real interventions that make a difference are those interventions that can be prescribed once upon a time by a pen and a prescription, and in the modern world, even easier by two clicks and epi, okay? There is a thinking that you have to be an interventional cardiologist. The reality is you don't. You're not the 90, we're not the 90 pound weakling. Those of us who don't go to the cath lab are not the proverbial 90 pound weakling in, 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 the, um, in the armamentarium of cardiology. So this is a, uh, a slide which I use often, which I think is one of the most important slides to keep in mind in clinical cardiology. So we all know that when a patient presents to the hospital with an acute coronary syndrome, particularly a non-STEMI especially, those patients go rapidly to the emergency room. Now, once upon a time, that was not always known, and it was a clinical trial that proved that. Um, and this is a slide from that trial. And I just want to sort of show you something. This is the winning arm of that trial. In other words, this is the winning data, um, TIMI 18B, looking at death, MI, and rehospitalization. And what that trial showed was about a 20% reduction in this composite endpoint in six months using a strategy of early intervention early aggressive approach. And this has become established foundation. Everybody knows that when a patient comes to the cath lab, when a patient comes to the hospital with an acute coronary syndrome, they got to go to the cath lab right away. But I want to just show you a little bit about sort of the next few months in the life of that patient and how that uh, event rate that occurs over the next six months develops and why it develops that way. So the reality is that at, at 30 days, the event rate is around seven and a half percent. Now, if you think about what happens to your patient who's, um, who's gone home from the hospital, you know, they've been discharged from the hospital, hopefully in a day or two, by 30 days, they're back at, their, they're back at home, they're back in their life, you know, as much as it's, uh, you know, not been impacted by COVID, they're back at work, they can do more or less what they want. And at that moment, you know, the system, we, the patient and their family, heave a collective sigh of relief. Because we know more or less, we think, that if they've made it to the first 30 days and basically they take care of themselves, um, the reality is uh, that they're out of the woods. What are they really? And if you fast forward over the six months that follows, during the period of time when we have presumed that the patient is really at no further significant risk, yeah, maybe something will happen here or there, maybe something will happen related to the stent, but for the most part, they're pretty much good. The reality is that if you look at the event rates in the five months following discharge, the five months following discharge, actually the event rate is actually higher than the event rate in the first 30 days. The slope of events is certainly higher in the first 30 days, but the cumulative burden of events is much higher. And the reality is, is that this period of time is when we all encounter the patient. The patient is typically not seen by the interventional cardiologist during this period of time. The patient is seen in this period of time by us, by the general cardiologist, by their primary care physician. And this is the opportunity for us to make a difference. Now you look at this and you say, well, that's not fair. Why should I be blamed for stuff related to the stent? In other words, maybe they didn't deploy the stent properly. Maybe the patient was resistant to, to, to the antiplatelets. But again, the reality is that that's not correct either because we know that as time moves on after an intervention, within the first year, if a patient who had a stent lasts 
April 19th, comes back to the emergency room today with an acute coronary syndrome, it's pretty likely that the culprit artery today will be the same one that happened last year ago. And this is something technically related to the stent. But the evidence shows that if you follow the patient longer and longer and longer and longer, the overwhelming likelihood is that with the new, that with, as the time clicks on, the culprit lesion that causes the patient to go back to the path lab a year after their stent, two years after their stent, three years after the stent, is not the artery that was stented two or three years ago, but is a new lesion that developed that wasn't present at the time of the index procedure two or three years ago. And that onus is on us because we are the ones who are watching the patient in the, in the years following their stent. And that's really the takeaway point that I wanted to sort of, um, you know, to sort of leave you with, which is, you know, every year around this time, U.S. News and World Report publishes their link of America's best hospitals. Um, and all the hospitals lie for it. And Mount Sinai, especially, you know, takes out advertisements, as does Montefiore, saluting <coughs> their ranking and where they are in cardiology and this and that. A number of years ago, there was a fascinating analysis um, run by the folks at Duke based upon the Crusade Registry that we were involved in, which asked the following question. If you look at what's going on in the care of the patients in those hospitals that rank the highest, what exactly is going on that is attributed, that is causing these hospitals to have the best outcome? What is exactly, and most importantly, is it transferable? And they looked at about 50 different variables. And what they came away with was that at the end of the day, the success in America's best hospitals did not have to do with whether or not your, your physician in the hospital is a cardiologist or not. Truthfully, it had little to do with whether or not the, pay, the hospital had an open heart program or the most advanced intervention. It had to do with guideline adherence, whether or not the patients at discharge and during their hospital stay receive the medical therapy that has been proven in clinical trials to make a difference in clinical cardiology. And the formula that they came up with and that has withheld over time is that every 10% in guideline adherence increase translates into an equivalent 10% reduction in mortality. And that opportunity is available to everyone. That opportunity is available to the head of the cath lab, and that opportunity is available to the intern caring for the case um, in the CCU or on the floor on the morning after, making sure that evidence-based medicine, that the residual risk that we have talked about is addressed, is within the power of everybody. And just along that same line, I just wanted to leave you with one quick little thing, um, which is looking at statin prescribing by clinic appointment time. So there's been a lot of evidence that you know, realizes that doctors are human too, and that we fatigue. And this looks at the, the likelihood in a cardiology practice, this is a 10,000 10, patient visits in statin IE patients, and compared to morning appointments, the odd ratio of a new statin for those with an afternoon question is significantly reduced. So you can see the likelihood of getting a statin order drops precipitously through the day. So for those of you, you know, who had clinic this morning and were perhaps prescribing a statin, great. And for those of you who uh, may be going to clinic this afternoon, remember this as well. So I wanted to just thank you for your attention. I hope that this was uh, helpful in terms of uh, identifying new ways to rethink what's often under our nose. And uh, I promise Ryan, we take some time for questions. So we have about seven minutes left. Excellent, thank you for that. That uh, very eye-opening talk, very much appreciated. Um, we'll open the floor to questions or the chat. Dr. Berger, I don't think if this is a question, he wrote it all caps with an exclamation point guidelines. Dr. No, Berger. not a question. Um, just thank you very much. I think that's something all the residents understand why I say that. I think that medicine, yes, on the extremes, there's a lot of room for expert opinion and, and stuff. But I think that if we look at um, what the primary data always shows, as well as how it's incorporated in the guidelines. Guideline adhering therapy um, is what leads to great outcomes. They're the guidelines for a reason. They may not be perfect. They may be different in 10 years with new information, but right now they're the best we have for the average person. And I thank you. And it, even with that, I, I'm amazed at how, how good the correlation was. Did they get into anything about, you know, a, a little deeper, like, I mean, a 1% increase to 1% reduction, that that's more than chance. I mean, that's a pretty impressive number.
that would be a number needed to treat of one. So um, is there anything beyond what was sort of on the slide you think that goes into that? In terms of what I said to you about the US hospitals, looking at the, the correlation? That and all your other points around how guideline and here in therapy really um, just seems yeah, to right. dramatically I, I improve think, care. You no, know, I mean, what I, I think your point is, and thank you for the question, um, I think your point is exactly right. The guidelines are guidelines. They're, they're supposed to be, you know, a framework for thinking. They're not, that's why they're called guidelines and not handcuffs. You know, they're, they're not, um, they're supposed to be, um, you know, just a, a, a way of, of thinking about uh, our, our patients. Um, I think you're absolutely correct that the guidelines, the good news about the guidelines in the modern world um, is that they have been bolstered a lot by, by a lot of evidence. The challenge, I think, is, is that over time, you know, as you correctly alluded to, the guidelines get revised every couple of years. And the challenge is, is that as the guidelines um, you know, evolve, two things happen. Number one, they get longer, so they get harder to read. So when you get Jack and you see that they've revised the guidelines for AFib, you say, great, next, you know, because they're too long to read. And that's why almost every time the guidelines come out, somebody actually writes a summary. So they reduce a 100-page document to a 10-page document where they try to say what's new. But consistent with that or coexisting with that, I would say, is the fact that as you look at over periods of time, and this was published in The Lancet a couple of years ago, that particularly in cardiology where the guidelines for a lot of different things are revised every couple of years, as you look from iteration one to iteration two, iteration three, the number of recommendations has gone up astronomically but the number of class one recommendations has gone down. And that's not because we lack evidence. I think within the spectrum of you know, the field of internal medicine, we have the best evidence of any field of medicine. Um, but the reality is, is that there's so much more to the management of patients that the people who write the guidelines, and I, I worked on a guideline committee with the antithrombotic guidelines a couple of years ago, and there's a great sort of propulsive you know, temptation to sort of weigh in on something and say, well, this is something that we, we wrestle with all the time, we know that our colleagues who are reading these guidelines, we can't just ignore it. So that's where you end up with a 2A or a 2B recommendation. And the reality is, as you probably know, a 2A recommendation means a you know, bunch of people sitting around a table say, raise your hand if you think we should do this or we should do that. So to your point, I think that's you know, sort of the underside of the, of, of, of the guidelines. Um, but I think they do emphasize that, like you said, that where the evidence is there, the evidence is really strong. We have about one minute left. There's one more question, I guess, in the chat. Um, should we measure lipid particle number? That's coming from a pulmonologist. So I think the question is, you know, who should be measuring right. lipid particle number on whom? And maybe even though you didn't really want to talk about primary prevention, you could talk about lipid right. particle so, number and primary prevention. Yeah, I'm just going to go back to the slides and sort of clarify that. So if you look, um, you know, there was the, the, the technology belonged to a company that tried to take this public um, and they, they sponsored a bunch of trials where they did it on everybody. And no surprise, um, that, that strategy failed. So I think the answer is, this is not a test that's required for everybody. The, reality, the way I look at this, I, again, I can't tell you from guidelines, although it's in the guidelines in, in different places, particularly for primary care, um, is I look at it the following. What I learned from this analysis is that here's a reasonable sized cohort of patients who to our simple first look, LDL of 70, HDL of 50, and a non-HDL of 94, they look pretty good. And yet one out of four of them was actually not good. And one out of four of them was like the patient that I showed at risk for ongoing recurrence of new disease and new blockages. So what I often do is for patients who have established coronary disease, once I get their lipids in shape to what I consider reasonable, I measure this once just to make sure that I'm not over, that I'm not patting somebody on the head when he or she is in this you know, green quarter of the slide. In primary prevention, I use it as well, not routinely, because a lot of the decisions that I think can be made from primary care can be made with other information. As I told you before in primary care, I think for primary prevention, you know, the trend is moving towards imaging as the adjunct to lipids. Um, there was a paper in Jack a couple of weeks ago, which looked at the incremental benefit of predicting cardiovascular risk in the primary prevention setting using two tests, a high sensitivity troponin and a CAT scan and a coronary calcium score. 
which may very well be the way we go in the future, because rather than predicting risk, this is actually looking at the patient and making an N equals one patient-based decision. But in terms of primary prevention, where I sometimes use this, is a 40-year-old person comes to me with a lipid profile and says, do you think I need to be on a statin? And depending upon, you know, other risk factors or things like that, sometimes I will do one of the, I do this or other adjunctive tests to drill down further to answer what I guess is a biochemical question is their atherogenicity. But as I've alluded to before, increasingly the trend, at least in cardiology, is to use imaging to directly visualize whether cardiovascular disease has already begun to be present. Thank you. You've given us a lot to think about. We have to quit. It's 101. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, everybody.